I was so excited to get my shipment from Last Bottle Wines in the mail the other day full of incredible red wines all from Napa Valley. I love wine tasting, so having this to my door couldn't be happier. Also couldn't be more excited that today's episode is brought to you by Last Bottle Wines. If you don't know already, they're a Napa-based online wine shop with a twist. They offer just one hand-picked wine per day until it sells out, and they're always at incredible prices. We're talking 30 to 70% off retail. And the best part is that there's no subscriptions, no fees, and no minimum purchase. And I could not be more excited to bring this offer right now because they're having a marathon sale, which is coming up March 28th and 29th. Even better, we're offering Dateable listeners 10% off your first order with code Dateable. So if you are a wine lover like me, this is a great time to join. And did I mention that shipping is 100% free? So So what are you waiting for? Mark your calendar for March 28th and 29th or get on it earlier if you want. You can sign up at lastbottlewines.com and use code DATEABLE and find out why Last Bottle is the most fun way to discover and buy amazing wine. We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Xu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. you also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dateable, a show all about modern dating, where we really try to get to the bottom of why people do the things they do and why do you do the things (laughs) that you do. Hello, Julie. <laughs> There's so many things that we do. So many Every time things. I say that in our intro now, it makes me question everything I do. Oh, a hundred percent. It goes beyond <laughs> dating, but it's actually a perfect episode that we have this week about Mm -hmm. the etiquette of modern dating. Because I think there's a lot of things that happen day to day and you do question, why am I doing this? What should I be doing? Am I handling this correctly? I think the questions go on and on because, you know, there is no Emily Post anymore. There's no like Mm -mm. etiquette guide that we used to have back in the day. And they're just all these like unwritten expectations and rules Mm -hmm. that keep changing with modern dating. So we got to keep up with them. But also they're up for discussion too. It's not like they're written in stone. So I think in this episode, we do question a few of them. Mm -hmm. And I think it it opens up a conversation for all of us to talk about like, is this still an etiquette that we want to follow? Or is this something we want to evolve from? We're very lucky to have Micah for this episode because she's quite well known in this space. And she's also someone who is not a stickler for traditional dating etiquette. And she's constantly evolving her business along with modern dating culture. So um, we're very lucky to have her as a guest. Yeah, it was great to talk to her. I think also like with so much changing right now with, you know, the way we date, like gender roles, like 
there is a lot on the table for etiquette. So before we get to that episode, it's been a very eventful day. I went to the Stop Asian Hate rally here in Los Angeles in Koreatown. I was pleasantly surprised because our very own May Lee, my girl crush, as you know, (laughs) was the MC of this entire rally. It was extremely organized. They had about 10 speakers, ranging from politicians to local uh, leaders, as well as a high school kid who made a very powerful speech. I got really emotional, Julie. I I didn't think I, I I was just like, oh, I want to go and support my community. But I didn't realize that it would bring up all these emotions of years and years of just suppressed and internalized um, anger that Mm -hmm. that really came through. And I'm wearing my shirt. I love it. Stop Asian hate shirt. I love it. I want to get one. I kept thinking we should make dateable ones to say like date without hate. Oh, I like it. Would that be cute? I like it. I like it. That's a good one. I definitely wish I actually went to a rally. I've been like very under the weather the last week, as you know, but I do feel like rallies are a great way to support one another. I mean, I can only imagine that you feel it even more when it's your race, like, you know, in question on the whole thing. But I definitely felt emotional when I went to the Black Lives Matter rally so I could see 100% how you could feel that way amplified, you know, when it's your own. And then we talked about this last time, too, with when the BLM um, rallies were going on. You do you. You show support however you think support should be shown. I really was compelled. I'm not usually a rally person. I was very much compelled this time to show to show support mm-hmm. in this way. And what I realized once I got there was it wasn't really about me showing support. It was actually very educational. I went to learn about what was happening and and what can be done at this point. And it was really great. Everybody that came on stage to speak said this line. They said, now's the time. This mm-hmm. is time for change. And I really feel like change is in the air And when it comes to the Asian community, which hasn't really banded together like this in the past. So I'm really proud of what we've done as a community, but there's just so much more learning for us to do. But back to that high school kid that came on stage to give this really powerful speech, and May loved him too. He said this, ever since I was little, I was told to walk away. You see bullying, you walk away. You see something wrong, you walk away. You see violence, you walk away. He said, I'm done walking away. Now it's my time to stand up and speak up. And I was like, holy shit. I I was like bawling. <laughs> and there were uh, five or six high school kids up on stage with him with signs and it starts with them. And I kept thinking, like, this is what, why we need this. It's mm-hmm. for the future of our generations who are who are going to be victims of discrimination if we don't do something about it. I also saw a great shirt that said, it's a nation, not discrimination. Oh, oh I like that, great. too. Yeah. So many merch ideas. So but... many. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I am so impressed by Gen Z. Like, they were the ones that mm. organized. I mean, there was like a rally in San Francisco for BLM that was... Mm-hmm what, like 20,000 people going across Golden Gate Bridge? It was insane. It was organized by Gen Z or high schoolers. So yeah, hats off to them. It's like Gen Zers are undoing all the bad things that we've done and Mm -hmm. our other generations before us. Because Gen Zers are not they don't come into this world with hate, but Mm -hmm. they see it and they're the ones cleaning our mess right now. So thank you for taking on that responsibility. You're a very good generation. I think though some of it though is that a lot of the stuff has been ingrained in us in Mm -hmm. so long and it actually kind of ties back to last week's episode with toxic masculinity Mm -hmm. and you know like how we talked about all the things that you know like even as women would say to men because we like perpetuated these situations We actually got a comment on YouTube that I thought was interesting that was toxic femininity is a Mm. problem too. And I agree. To me, at least, feminism is equality. And I think like toxic femininity is when we start to man hate. So I do totally see that point. But I don't think it either it's like toxic masculinity or toxic femininity. But the fact that we're like pointing fingers also shows that there's like a larger problem too. And that's the point here is we need to stop pointing fingers. And the first place to go is to look inward and think about what are the beliefs that you have grown up with that are so ingrained in you. And now's the time to challenge 
to those beliefs. And one very good example is very recently uh, a listener of ours emailed in and um, called me out for something I said in a previous episode. It was why is sex closeted? And I made a comment about how Asian women were the gateway for homosexuality. A lot of gay men do a layover with Asian women before they become fully, fully out. You know, I I very much respect that this woman called me out and said, why why are you still perpetuating these stereotypes of Asian women? And I had to stop and think, why did I say that? Mm-hmm. You know, that's something I've been saying for years. It's something I've been telling people. I thought it was an interesting fact. I first read it in the book Middlesex, but I never stopped to think, why am I still supporting this fact? Because it is based in a stereotype of, of Asian women being one, androgynous, and two, feminine. So these are two combination um, of characteristics that that make it okay for a closeted man to be in a relationship with before they fully come out. And even saying that, even if it's joking, even if it's a statement, it doesn't matter. It perpetuates those stereotypes. So Mm -hmm. I fully own up to the comment and I fully own up to the fact that I didn't even stop and think about how that affected this entire movement as a whole and how I'm undermining what we're going through. So I appreciate all the call outs. Julie and I are putting ourselves in the public here and we're not always right. So I really appreciate when people can come back with constructive criticism and call us out for things that we say that we probably should not be saying. Well, as one of our past guests, Chris said, she was calling you in, not calling you out, which I appreciate (laughs) that sentiment, actually. Yeah. You know, like, I think sometimes I remember when you said that on the episode and because you're Asian, I didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, she's saying Mm. it. I I feel like if I had said that, it would have been like, oh, that's clearly inappropriate. But in a way, like using your own race kind of gives you like a get out of jail free card. Mm. I know I've definitely like said stuff about Jewish people before about being cheap. And I'm like, I don't like that stereotype. Why would I say something Mm. like that? And in a way, you're like, oh, it's okay because I am saying it about myself, it does just perpetuate it. Like that's not yeah. like, yeah, it's not like helping anyone. So like we have to cut this. And I heard like, you know, jokes about like comedians have done this for years. Oh so my it's gosh, like, yes. <laughs> it's it's hard though because it's like at some level this is the world that we're in that like every word is scrutinized but it is bringing awareness to things that just like aren't okay anymore it's good to scrutinize i used to think we were hypersensitive but it is good to scrutinize because it makes you pause and think mm-hmm. and after everything that's been happening recently i just i'm going to take a pledge to pause and think about the things that I say. I'm going to look look inward and question my beliefs because I really believe for change to happen, it starts with us. We can't Mm -hmm. say, oh, the world needs to do this. We need better leaders. We need better this. No, we need better people from the inside out. So if we can all just be that person and make a pledge to yourself, if I see something that's inappropriate, I'm going to call it out. If I hear something inappropriate coming out of myself, I'm going to call myself out. Make that promise to yourself. If we can all take responsibility for our own words and actions, this world will become a better place. I think pause and think is a key word here. Pause and think is something that we can apply to our dating lives 100%. It actually, I had this revelation this week that I wanted to share with you. Oh, yes, please. So it actually like comes back to the facts. Like, I mean, you know this UA, but I've been actively looking for a house to own as a first time Mm -hmm. homeowner. And we've talked about this when you bought a house that there's a lot of parallels to dating that you're you're so like, many. <laughs> you're like on Tinder, but it's Zillow. And you're like, you know, does this meet all my expectations? Like there's a lot of choices. It's a big decision. So it's yes. kind of like up there in who you're going to spend the rest of your life with. For sure. So I've been going out with my realtor, Zara Robotham, who, by the way, I'm just going to give her a quick plug because she is freaking phenomenal. She's anyone, awesome. <laughs> anyone in the SF Bay area that's looking for a realtor, like if you need someone, definitely check out robothamrealestate.com or if you can't remember that you could just do zara real estate at gmail.com like zara like the clothing store <laughs> so i'll give that plug first and also a ton of our friends have bought oh yeah with zara 
<laughs> like a ton of our friends this year. She knows her shit. And she also joked, and this is where I'm getting into it with her. She joked that she's also part-time therapist, psychologist. <laughs> you know, it's like move over bartender. It's the realtors that really got, get all okay. your emotions unloaded. Yes. Like she's like, you would not am- believe. Like I think Selling Sunset needs to like do a show that shows like the insider <laughs> real estate <laughs> of like, because it's like you're about to drop like all the money you've earned for like for your whole life mm-hmm. on this purchase can you imagine the emotions going through it's like when you're at the altar and you're like should i do this should i not do this mm-hmm. you know? <laughs> and anyways like um i've definitely had a moment that i've seen a lot of places but i'm kind of like i said to her i'm like i i like everything i've seen mm-hmm. but i haven't been like this is the one and a lot of people say that they get that feeling when they like see the property that they end up being with and it actually made me think about dating and i'm like <laughs> i think I think this is how I am in dating too. Like I think a lot of it probably stems from my perfectionist tendency, right? Mm-hmm. We all know I'm a perfectionist from our schemas episode and all that. Um, and I was thinking about like Logan too. Logan Yuri, one of our past guests, her like three, basically what type of dater are you? Are you the hesitator? Are you the maximizer? Are you the romanticizer? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, am I being the romanticizer that I know exactly what I want in my mind, but it is it realistic? Am I realistically mm-hmm. going to find something that has all the qualities in the price point, in the location? Like, am I just having this like massive checklist that never lets me move forward because I have unrealistic expectations? Mm. Or am I the hesitator? Because, you know, there's a little bit of me that's like unsure of a few things in my life. And I'm like, is this the right time to commit? It's kind of like when you don't have like your career 100% in a relationship. Is it the right time to commit to a serious relationship? relationship? Or am I the maximizer that I think that there's like something better out there every turn of the way? So I was like, wow, there's really so many parallels with dating and real estate that I think that, you know, real estate agents really should be the next dating coaches. (laughs) Interesting. Um, interesting <laughs> correlation there. Uh, when I found my place, I definitely certainly did not think it was the one. I looked at mm. 50 places and I came to this conclusion that I probably will not find the one when it came to my dream house. But my boyfriend said this to me, as long as the foundations are good, everything else can be changed. Mm. And I feel that applies to dating too. As, as mm-hmm. long as someone's foundationally a good person and you feel like you can be with them, and you align, everything else can change. It's super easy. So I feel like in the last month that I've lived at my new place, I've made it into the one for me. And I'm completely Mm. and utterly in love with it now. Wow, that is the best (laughs) parallel to dating I've ever heard. And maybe that's really where the perfectionists are getting held back like myself Mm. is that I think for me, what something has held me back is that I have this idea of the person I want Mm -hmm. because I've dated enough, because I've had enough relationships that I'm like, I know what qualities I really jive with. That Mm -hmm. on one side, I'm like, it's good because I'll know it when I see it. But then on the other side, maybe it's not letting people that have enough of the foundation grow into that one, like you were just saying. Mm -hmm. And one of the hesitations about my place is that a family of four lived here before. And I kept thinking, oh my gosh, this this has seen so many hands. (laughs) This has seen so many butts (laughs) in the toilets. You know, it just, it felt so used. But at the same time, now that I've lived in this place and I've learned to love it, I realize this place has loved so many people and so many mm. people have loved it back that it made it made it feel really warm. It felt it felt like broken into like a nice pair of PJs. It felt really like home. Here's another parallel to you too, is that everyone is going to be that used house, right? Someone's <laughs> lived in that house before, but instead of looking at it as, oh, other hands has been on have been on this house or damaged this house. This house has given love and has been loved back by others. I also just want to point out what a way to change your mindset. That is like the <laughs> ultimate spin, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So Julie's gonna go out there and find her dream house today. I love it. I love like- it. Well, that's what Zara was saying. She's like, I think that the mindset does shift because when you're ready, then you walk in and you start to see these places as being it. You know, mm-hmm. and yep. that we say that all the time with dating. Once you're ready, when back to like the episode we did with Jesse and Cassie, when your light is on, not to throw a Sex in the City reference, but we'll 
do it. The light Always. is on, right? The light is on. The, the last tie into uh, etiquette that I was actually thinking about with real estate. There was one that I totally did this thing that like, you know how you go on a date and you show up and you're like, this was the best date ever. I'm going to move forward with it. I had such a good time. And then you get home and you're like, did I? Did I have a great time? Yeah. I totally did that to a realtor. Not my realtor, but the realtor mm. selling. I was like, I'm so into this place. I'm going to go home and like look at all the paperwork and reach out with all the questions. And then I got that feeling of like, mm. actually, this isn't it. And then I just ghosted. And I'm like, is that bad etiquette? Like, should I have followed up? I don't know. It's so many parallels to dating. <laughs> Uh, I feel like we could spend hours on all the parallels <laughs> to dating uh, right now because you can also rent or you can buy. You can. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, the list goes on. But maybe we should actually, we are going to try like a little bit of a new segment here. Get so many questions from you all. And we want to take a second to be able to answer some. So please continue to send your questions in, whether that's like through the Facebook community, Love in the Chime of Corona. If you're not already in it now, we'll name drop it here. Or if you just want to email us at hello at datablepodcast.com, we get tons of emails. But we're going to try to like pick ones that are relevant to the topic too, just to bring it home. So we actually got one that I think fits in super well with dating etiquette. So you guys, should we do just like a quick kind of Q&A with it? Yeah, we're kind of bringing back question of the day. We figure this is a good time to bring it up in our intros. So the question we've gotten, and we've actually gotten the same question from a few different people. It's, uh, I've been on a few bad video dates, okay? Mm -hmm. And so bad sometimes that I just want to get off the call pretty early. But I don't know what's proper etiquette. Is there something that I can say or do so it doesn't hurt the other person's feelings for mm. trying to get out of a video date or getting off a video call. I feel like this with um, work meetings. <laughs> How do I get out of the Zoom call? <laughs> How do I get out early? It is a little harder on video dates because you see them face to face. On the phone, you could be like, oh, I'm cooking dinner or you can make up an excuse. But on video, it's harder to lie. So I would say don't lie, but also don't be that honest. Like this is a terrible video date. <laughs> I need to get out. I think something that I tend to do is just like, okay, I mean, like, it's been really fun talking to you. I'm tired now. I've had back to back work video calls. So if you don't mind, I would love to just, you know, get on with my night or go cook dinner or whatever your next activity would be because it's just showing that it's not about them it's really about just your day in general I love that it's like zoom fatigue blame it on yeah. zoom fatigue right the other trick I have this isn't great etiquette but I'll throw it out now and then I'll go to my actual one is that my phone is about to die which knowing me it is a lot of times but <laughs> probably not the best etiquette but I think like etiquette wise I think I see where this question is coming in because it's really freaking awkward to tell someone like, I don't want to, you know, like keep talking to you on a video on my couch where I'm doing nothing. Like I'd mm -hmm. rather like go back and watch TV by myself than continue this conversation. That's a mm -hmm. hard conversation to have if you want to get out of it. So I think like having some sort of plan, I get that nowadays that we don't have as many plans lined up, but you know, things are reopened. Opening. People are like, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel with the pandemic. Or you could even just be like, I have my virtual sounding board event, or I have mm -hmm. my virtual game night with friends, whatever it may be. I think there's many ways that you can kind of spin that. And having like some sort of exit plan, it also makes you more well rounded. It shows mm -hmm. that you're not someone that's just spending hours and hours and hours on video calls, whether you like them or not. Mm -hmm. But it also gives you that out. Yes. And to prevent this conversation from happening just in general is just set some parameters. I think there's nothing wrong with going into a video date saying, I get video or Zoom mm -hmm. fatigued very easily. So I would love to keep our video date to 30 minutes. Then, yeah. you know, at 30 minutes, Everyone gets to get out. <laughs> you don't have to make up an excuse anymore. I think just setting the expectations from the very beginning, now that you know yourself well, is better than trying to make an excuse in the moment. That's a great idea because you could always have another video call or take it mm -hmm. to real life if you like the person. And then if you don't, you have it out now. Yep. 
I think the other piece too is, I know this is like a little off topic, but the etiquette, like if you really don't find them a match and they follow up after, I still think the etiquette follows through. Like if this was a real date, like just tell them at that point, like that it wasn't the right fit. Like I think you can like spin that in a nice way that they'll find their match. Like I'm positive that person's out there. Just, I don't feel like it's the right fit between us. I know people are hesitant to do that because it's virtual and all that, but sometimes you really can tell. Like, if you just can't hold a conversation with someone, there's nothing wrong with cutting out at that point. Just don't be like ghost and be an asshole, essentially. <laughs> There you go. Hope that answered your question to a, a lot of you that had the same <laughs> question. Okay. So shall we go into some sponsors? This episode is sponsored by Via. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Via has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Via also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to ViaHemp.com and use the code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's ViaHemp.com and use the code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. This episode is made possible by Badlands Pets. As you all know, Mojo, my precious baby, is the reason why I found love in the first place. He made me feel love again. So I would do anything to ensure his health and longevity. And actress Katherine Heigl and I have that in common. She's helped save over 16,000 dogs through her foundation. And after doing a ton of research, she feels there's one place we can look to to improve any dog's health, and that's their food. So fortunately, she found that just by adding a few special superfoods to her dog's food, she saw huge transformations in their health. So she's made a 20-minute video explaining step-by-step how anyone can do the same thing to see incredible changes in their dog's health. I've definitely re-looked at what I'm feeding Mojo and making sure that he only has one life to live and I want to make sure it's the best damn life. So if you want to keep your dog healthy and happy, go to badlandsfood.com slash dateable and watch Catherine's video right now. Again, that's B-A-D-L-A-N-D-S-F-O-O-D.com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E. Living with ADHD can be a challenge and dating with ADHD is definitely a challenge. We've heard many of you say, but finding the right care and proper tools needed to succeed can be life-changing. Done is an online ADHD care platform that can get you all the resources you need to help manage your ADHD. Online visits, refills, and a 24-7 care team made for you. In just one minute, Dunn's online assessment can help kickstart your ADHD treatment journey. With experienced clinicians, worry fill refills, and online visits, you can start getting personalized care as soon as today or tomorrow. So contact an expert team that can help you around the clock and get a personalized treatment plan just for you. Here's how you do it. Take a free one-minute assessment and book an appointment with a licensed ADHD clinician as soon as the next day. Get continuous care, one-click refills, insurance coverage, and 24-7 care team support with Done for just $79 a month. And pharmacy co-pays as low as $0. Visit get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. That's get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. Done. Turn ADHD into your strength. Okay, so shall we should we hear all about modern dating etiquette? Take it away, Micah. What 
what is etiquette? Let's just, I feel like it's an antiquated term now, but it is the set of rules or customs that control accepted behavior in particular social groups or social situations. And you probably heard of Emily Post, an American author and socialite who was famous for writing about etiquette. But now we have Micah Meyer to talk about modern etiquette and tips to make you instantly more polished. She's 37 years old, currently lives in New York. She's been there for 12 years on and off, originally from Sarasota, Florida, and she is married. Hi, Micah. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for being our first etiquette coach on <laughs> Dateable. She's dubbed the queen of good manners who teaches kids, teens, and adults about topics including social behavior, business, dating, dining, weddings, and more. She's also the author of Modern Etiquette Made Easy, a five-step method to mastering etiquette. And we originally got in touch because Vemo reached out to us and was was had a really interesting pitch about just Vemo etiquette in general. Um, but then we thought, let's just open up the conversation and make it more about modern etiquette. It's endless, like everything. It's and it all comes <laughs> it all comes back to it, right? It is yeah. endless, but it is kind of a forgotten topic. And we define what etiquette is. What do you think etiquette means when it? when we're talking about like in a dating sense? To, you know, to me, everything and kind of no matter what I'm teaching, whether it's dating or business etiquette, it all comes back to thinking about the other person first. So mm. thinking about, you know, and earlier when you mentioned it being antiquated as a term, I get that all the time. People are always like, do we even still need this anymore? But <laughs> it's actually, I kind of always think it's it's more important or just as important, we could argue now as ever before, because everything is changing. And really all it is, is kind of like a, a protocol by which to show respect to other people. So as we start dating, you know, in different types, like now there's video dating is like the new norm with COVID. Right. So that didn't exist a year ago. So now there are all these new rules. So I think it's always like a set of guidelines more so than rules to help us just be nice. Um, at the end of the day, it's kind of how I see it. Interesting. So what do you think's changed the most in modern times since like Emily Post put out all the and like traditional yeah. etiquette terms. Yes. Um, you know, I own, I think I own every single Emily Post book there, there ever was people, for, <laughs> people like clean out their grandparents attics and like donate them to my company. It's amazing. <laughs> the old ones we have. Um, and I would say the biggest thing would be gender and kind of like roles in gender mm -hmm. that I see. Like for instance, I just was reading um, an etiquette book that somebody sent me even from the nineties and it was a social etiquette book. And it was like, women should stay seated. So if you're at a dinner, say a man and a woman, the man would be the only person to stand and the woman would stay seated. Mm. And that was the 90s. And I kind of thought, huh. So I think those are the, like nowadays in modern etiquette I teach, if someone walks up to your table, you both stand to shake hands. You never stay seated mm -hmm. to shake hands. So um, who pays on a date and why? Who asks out? So it used to be if it was a man and a woman in a relationship, the woman would have to be wait to be approached. She could never mm -hmm. approach a man. Things like that. Who yeah. is the one establishing these etiquette <laughs> guidelines. I don't know who used to do it, but now I'm doing it. <laughs> I, like, I like took over. I'm like, guys, guys, we got to get this together. Um, so actually, to be perfectly honest, I'm constantly making up new rules all the mm. time all the time because these things never existed before. These questions never existed. We didn't have Venmo years ago. We didn't have, you know, same sex relationships or even up until a certain point, you know, you wouldn't talk about them in society. Even when, you know, my uncle growing up, he is a gay man in Boston. He was like, you could not, like he lived during that time. And, mm -hmm. and I hear his stories and he's like, Mike, this is so cool what you do because you're talking about I just was um, coaching a same-sex marriage to gentlemen and was walking them through their groom's etiquette. And we were like cutting out all like the bride and groom sayings and who sits on the bride side and the groom <laughs> side and they're reading their etiquette book. And I was like, let's rewrite these rules. These are no longer modern. So yeah, it's as society evolves, we need to evolve with it. So are there like any hard, fast, universal rules that kind of apply to everyone when it comes to dating? I can think of a few offhand, but I'd love your thoughts. Yes, you know, I think, um, I mean, for, for me, it's almost like 
it, there's always a thank you. If somebody ever picks up a, a tab or ever, doesn't matter, even if you don't like them and or you didn't feel like there was a big spark, I still think if somebody took the time to ask you out and then treated you, it's still a nice thing to show gratitude. Mm. I, I still think if someone asks you out or has the courage to do that um, or to approach you, never to be rude because that's someone's feelings. No matter how you feel or don't feel about them, I feel like it, you know, like saying no in the most respectful way you can because it's right. a lot of courage for people to do that. Um, I still think my general guideline for who pays is whoever asks out is the person that pays. Mm. So if I mm. ask out, it doesn't matter my gender. If I'm a woman dating another woman, a man dating another man, a man dating a woman, a woman dating a man, mm. it doesn't matter. If I'm the person that says, listen, I want to take you to this concert on Saturday night and it's at this time. And you know, then I'm the one who supplies the tickets. I don't get the tickets and say, Oh, by the way, it'll be $50. You know, <laughs> right. I plan. I have like, so I'm, I'm a big believer in, um, yeah. Who asks who pay, is whoever pays. I think one that stands out for me is like, don't be on your phone. I feel like that is like a universal, yes. like someone is giving you their time. Yes. Like do not abuse that time. That kind of also yes. goes for like showing up super late. Like I get it. Like things happen, but I think you should always like send a text or something. If you're going to be more than like a couple minutes late. Yeah, that's a big one for me. I agree completely. That is that is a perfect universal one because it's it's showing lack of respect for someone else's time. And another universal one would be I think show up for that person. What I mean is like, put yourself together, you know, a little bit, a little bit of effort. Mm. If someone took the time to come and meet you at a restaurant mm. or, you know, or even nowadays a video, you know, right. if somebody took the time to schedule you in then just like put your hair back or, you know, make yourself whatever it is that you need to do to make yourself look, you know, presentable oh just God. to look yeah. like you rolled out of bed is like, Oh, thanks for the effort. Right. Um, I remember a friend of mine did like a mock, she's a dating coach and she did a mock date and um, myself and some other people were there like observing it from afar Ooh. and the guy showed up in gym shorts and we were like whoa wow. like that is just like <sighs> I get it like I, I guess I don't get it I shouldn't even say I get it but like I feel like if yeah. a guy ever showed up in gym shorts it just the impression is I didn't I don't give a fuck about this date at all yeah yeah I think so too I feel like etiquette is a two-step process step number one don't be an asshole so that's just baseline <laughs> common sense <laughs> <laughs> and then step two is how do you take it to the next level and show up just a little extra for the person you're on a date with? What do you think about this scenario, Micah? A friend of mine went on a date with this guy. Now they met on they met online and the messaging, the messaging back and forth was very unclear who asked whom out first. Mm. So he okay. was like, Oh, we should definitely meet up. And she's like, Yeah, maybe Saturday. And he's like, What do you think about this bar? And she's like, That bar sounds good, or we can go to this one. So it seemed like a joint effort. And when they right. met up, she felt like there was no chemistry. He ordered on his tab two drinks, one for her, one for him. And the date ended after a drink. And afterwards, he asked her out again. She was like, I'm sorry, I'm just not feeling it. I, I don't think there should be a second date. And he ended up Vemo requesting her for mm. her drink. Oh, what do you think oh. about this? So this is not the first time, sadly, I've heard this <laughs> question. I actually, yeah. Um, you know, I feel like you should never ask for money just because someone wasn't didn't react to you the way that you wanted. It's either you are splitting the bill up front and that's like a, like that if, if he wanted to ask for it, he should have asked for it up front, not just because she didn't want to see him again. I think that would be considered very rude. And I think she dodged a bullet, to be honest. Yeah. I think that just is, you wouldn't, you just don't treat people like that. It's not, it's not like, okay, I don't know. It's almost like you were, um, if you agreed to go out with them, then he'd be willing to financially put money toward her. And I just, it rubs me the wrong way. I don't like it. The paying thing is really tricky. I, I always say pay with intentions, not pay for pay with expectations. And I yeah. think in this case, he expected that if he paid for her, she would accept a second date. And when that wasn't met, he wanted his money back, which is the yeah. worst way because you should go in with the intention that I want to pay for her regardless of what happens. Right. I right. would so much rather someone just be like, can we split it? I actually had this happen once. Like the guy was like, you can Venmo me later. And I'm like, look, we're just going <laughs> to split it or not. Like I'm not Venmoing you later. Like I'm probably never going to see you 
again. Like, come on. Yeah. But here's yeah. Your double standard, Micah. I love your opinion because you said it earlier, like whoever asks should pay. That's kind of like the new age rule that you're saying. We right. have this situation though, that it's like as women, especially UA and I both are kind of like this elder millennial that, and actually we're around the same age as you. It's like we have the old traditions, but then the new things that come in. So right. even though like I fully like understand in my mind that like it should be equal there's something about like this tradition of the man paying Mm -hmm. that gets in the way of that still and then there's other women for example that are like no I want to pay because I'm an equal person Mm -hmm. and all this so what do men and women do in this time right so you know I think I'm a little bit more like you both in that way um you know, although I fully expect to pay, like if tomorrow, tomorrow I were on a date and this happened, I would fully go in expecting to pay if I, if I need to, if I, whatever. But I think it's a really nice thing when someone treats you because it's a sign of generosity and that they want to take care of you, but not in the financial sense to me anymore. It's not like I don't have a job and therefore you need to take, it's like they want to treat me because they're generous. They want to take care of me. Um, even if it's like a picnic and they supply everything, it's not necessarily about a financial thing. It's like, they want to take care of you. And that's what I like about it is like somebody, um, now for me, it's, I guess I should be clear about whoever asks out and chooses the location and whatever is the one that pays. That is like the expectation for me. So for instance, if I go out and a guy asks me out, picks everything up, then the expectation is that he would pay, but I would never just sit there and wait for him to pull out his wallet. Like I would always Mm. like take out my wallet and show that I'm willing to be the equal here. Um, but if he chose the wine, chose the restaurant, like that was his budget. You know, so that's what bothers it about like that. It's not like, hey, Micah, where would, where should we go? Should we go to the taco stand? Okay. Because I suggested it because it was within my budget. But if someone literally picks the nicest restaurant in town, picks the wine, like they're playing host. And then at the end to be like, oh, and PS, here's half the bill. That's where I, that's where it doesn't work for me. That happened to me once. (laughs) It happened to me too. Yeah, and it was actually one of the most infuriating nights of my life because, like, I remember this guy invited me to this really nice restaurant. I normally never accept, like, restaurants as a first date. And this actually is what sealed that for future. And we got there. There was just no connection. I was stuck at this meal. And then at the end, the bill came. And he wasn't, like, even reaching for it at all. So I don't know if he was, like, expecting me to pick it up. So eventually I was just, like, it it sat for like 10 minutes. It was so uncomfortable. Oh, and awkward. so awkward. And then eventually I'm just like, okay, so we're splitting this. And he just was like, yep. And I'm like, you don't know my financial situation. Like you don't know mm-hmm. anything about me. It was just so rude. And it, I mean, there was many reasons why there wasn't a second date, but that was like the nail on the coffin for me. You know what? That is, that is awful. That And it's kind of like, you know, it, but don't you agree though? It's not necessarily about like them taking you to the nicest restaurant and no. expecting it's no. that feeling of being taken care of, right? Because it has nothing to do with us not working and making our own way. It's right. like you want someone yes. to like say, I plan this. I'm going to open, you know, the door, not because you're a woman, but because I care about you. Yep. Not because I don't think you can do it yourself because I want to take care of you. It's like that sense of like, you know? Micah, I think you, you said it so clearly for me, which is you're playing host. I don't want to be taken care of in the sense of financially, but I want to be taken care of in terms of your guest. And yes, if yes. you're the one playing host, then you take care of your guests. No, it doesn't matter the gender roles. It's like if you have friends in town, you show them around your right. city because that's what right. you're doing. You're playing host. So I, I want to make that distinction because it's not about who is the one financially providing. It's more just the role of playing host. Yes, exactly. And I love what you said too. It's like you don't have, like you can go to, for a picnic. You could go for a coffee. You can go for like a drink. Like that's all a lot more affordable than than going for that huge dinner where you just don't, and especially sticking someone with the bill on a huge dinner that you don't know their financial situation. So here's another situation that happened. Uh, Another friend of mine, I think it's the same friend. Now I think about it. She's going on dates. Well, she's happily married with a kid now, but this is all, this all happened years ago. She went on a date with a guy. He planned out the entire date and he paid and all that and took care of her. And at, at the end of the date, they went for a walk and 
she asked, do you, would you like some tea? I kind of, I'm a little thirsty. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. So they went to a tea shop and when it came time to pay, so he's standing at the cash register. He stepped back and said, you are the one that requested the tea. So your turn to pay. <sighs> I, I don't know. I'm a little conflicted about that. Cause yeah, she is the one that requested it, but he took that awkward step back <laughs> and waited for her to step up to the register. I, I don't know. I don't know. Thoughts? Uh, yeah, no, I don't like that either. I think it's like, <laughs> these are, these are like unwritten. See, that's the thing. So etiquette, I have to say this is all about social intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about thinking yep. of other people first. And although in that situation, he is technically right with the new like guidelines of modern etiquette. He's technically right. She invited him. She suggested it. She, you know, that was her thing, but he then should never have said that he should have either just, you know, let her pay or, you know, and gone about it. However, she never intended to, then he should have stepped up to the plate, you know, paid for paid for it if that's what was happening. And then that would have been his sign that he didn't want to see her again, if he felt so strongly about that. But to actually, you would never tell someone you are paying now. It's either like, you just wouldn't do that. Yeah. Or worst case, and I wouldn't even recommend this, like, it's like, you would pay for your own, your right. 50, 50 if you felt that strongly about it. Um, but you wouldn't tell someone else now you're paying for me. It's either splitting it 50 50 or you're paying. It's not now you are paying for both of us. That <laughs> is he's like doubly strange to me. Yeah, dictating how someone else spends their money. Yeah, is nobody probably tells not you good to pay etiquette. For I think no. also, like, I know there are some rules of etiquette, like if we like, you know, follow you and other people in the etiquette space, but I do think a lot of it is unwritten still, right? Like a lot of it, you just said, mm -hmm. is social intelligence. And I think just because that's his set of rules doesn't mean it's her set of rules. And Correct. you can't assume that, like, you either have to have a conversation or you need to, like, just be normal about it. Correct. I agree. And, and it's also like, I have the thing where I will say it's bad etiquette to correct bad etiquette. <laughs> <laughs> right? And like it instantly makes people feel uncomfortable, right? It's right. like this is such an amazing conversation, but let's just take like a really quick break to talk about some messages that we have. This episode is brought to you by the book Courage Under Fire, known for her unique blend of action-packed, suspenseful stories set against the expanse and beauty of the American West. New York Times bestselling author Lindsay McKenna brings us back to Silver Creek, Wyoming for a powerful story of one man's quest to protect the courageous woman he loves from a dangerous threat to their future. So let's zoom in on the storyline. Seeking an escape from her dark past, Carissa Taylor heads to Silver Creek to build a new life. Maybe she can finally be more than a hunted woman fleeing a vengeful killer, a man who's been after her nearly all her life. But when the enraged stepbrother breaks out of prison and draws closer and closer to Carissa, a rancher named Chase enters the scene. You can find more about this book, Courage Under Fire, by Lindsay McKenna at kensingtonbooks.com or wherever books are sold. I don't want to harp on this payment paying thing too much, but I do still find it so fascinating. So I, I do yeah. have one more scenario okay. for you, which is we've talked about this on previous episodes too. It's the guilt, um, guilt pay. So what I mean by this is a few of my girlfriends will agree to this is we go on a date with someone and if we feel there's no chemistry, we can, we pick up the check out of guilt. Yeah. Have you yes. heard of this? Yes. <laughs> what do you think about that? So I've never heard that term guilt pay, but I like it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think I actually think there's something to it because here's the thing, because at what I said in the beginning about if somebody pays for you, you should still say thank you. This way you're almost getting out of that. You're almost saying like, mm. I owe you nothing, like right. not even a thank you. You know, mm. like you can thank someone at the end of the date for their time. Like thanks for meeting. It was really nice to meet you. But then it takes away that awkward for me, like that night or the next day saying thank you. That was really kind of you mm. to treat me to dinner because actually I paid for myself and I don't need to, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think. I don't know. I just think, yeah, I would do the same to be you honest. You're on board or at with least, it. Okay. Yeah. Or I would at least offer maybe that person's insistent, like, no, please, this is my treat. And I always think if you offer once and then the person really insists, you don't want that awkward back and forth, like tug of tug of war. Mm -hmm. So I would offer. Um, and then I would kind of say, okay, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. But I definitely agree. And to this day, when I go out with my girlfriends, I'm an excellent wing woman because I have no fear. Um, <laughs> but I'll sit there and they'll send me off sometimes to talk to people to, to bring people back to the table. 
Um, but sometimes if we're at a bar and someone approaches us, even if that bottle of champagne, you know, that we know they were probably going to order for us looks good. If we don't want to talk to that person, we will say, no, thank you. That's so kind. Like we're all set. We would never take free drinks from anybody mm. just for the free drink ever. Ever, that's ever, a ever. great rule mm. of etiquette for women. I think that's because I think that's where men get resentful of it. And that's what actually like a lot of times men will say like, well, I don't want to pay for this woman on the first day because this day and age, so many first dates never go anywhere. And right. there's like that stereotype of like kind of women taking men for like free food and, you know, and mm-hmm. using right. dating that way. So I guess, okay. So I, I feel like we have so many things to talk about, but this one is so interesting that I do want to ask one more also so it's like of course. okay with payment so first date I love this idea of who's like hosting and I also think I don't know what your thoughts are on this but like I've been in situations where for example the guy's like let's go for a picnic like I'll pick up wine do you want to get cheese or like mm. something where the expectation is said ahead of time and for whatever reason that doesn't sit as bad with me mm-hmm. than when I get the bill when the bill comes and they're like are you going to pay yeah. half? Mm-hmm. So I don't know if there's like what your thoughts are, because I do hear men loud and clear that like, it's freaking expensive to date. And, mm, yeah. you know, like, even if the woman asks, like, there's still mixed signals. Like, I don't want to necessarily be the one that is like, yeah. making her pay for the whole date and all of that. Like, how can men navigate this if they are going on all these dates that may never go anywhere? Yeah, yeah, I know it is hard. Um, You know, I think that is, um, I would say, say, you know, maybe it's a lesson in being choosy and not just going out with a hundred people. Like I think, you know, I'm a big believer in like, I like the picnic idea. I like that a lot. Um, I think as long as that person, if they are saying, why don't you bring this? As long as they're not assigning you the more expensive thing, right. you know, like that would probably, if he was like, I'll bring the cheese, you bring your favorite bottle of wine. I'd be like, what? Yeah. Um, I'm still a big believer in like, he should have taken the whole picnic. If he mm. was like, I would rather him say, let's just meet and go for a walk along the West side highway or along the bay, like, and rather than assign you something. Yeah. I guess now that I'm thinking about it, I mean, I, I would say like when I got this, I wasn't like a hundred percent turned off but I wasn't like oh this is great either it was kind of like that middle neutral confusion I don't like like it think about it now and I'm like why didn't he just say I'll get the wine like it's the same money to him right like Mm -hmm. it's yeah I think where he's coming from though is probably like this place of equality like I'll bring some you bring some you know right I don't know I get it I I totally get it I just think at the same time if we let's say if it's a male female relationship and in turn it's like maybe like the however many dates and you decide that you want to, um, you want to maybe, um, ha- cook dinner. Like you then wouldn't be like, I'll make the steak. Please bring the potato salad and the <laughs> right. Like, Can I you bring a tomato? Like- Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just feel like um, in that respect, it's kind of, it's still, we would be taking care of them, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I would say that the dinner parties I go to, the host does assign something. You're in charge of the appetizers, and then this group is in charge of the dessert. But in that kind of setting, I don't know, it's a group thing, and you kind of understand how laborious it is to cook for all these people. But when it's right. a one on one situation, I would much rather just have him say, these are things I'll be bringing. If there's anything else you like, feel free to bring that. But on a date, I feel fine in like a dinner party or something like that. But if it's like a one-to-one, I have a problem with it. Yeah, I yeah. Like, I think it's yeah. a one-to-one. Yeah. But I do think it's good etiquette if you're cooking dinner because I love this. I've definitely cooked dinner for boyfriends before, and they're like, "What type of wine should I bring?" Yeah. Like, I think something like that is great. I etiquette. agree. So, yeah, what is I your agree. thoughts to as the relationship evolves? Like, because I think it's not sustainable this day and age for men to be paying all the time. Should it right. be that like after? certain amount of dates that it goes to one gender versus another like does it follow what you said like who just invites and it kind of is an even distribution that way or is it like a split down the middle I think you have to I think it depends on the couple and on each per it's like so situational like for instance my husband is very old-fashioned if you will about he pays you know he was like I'm paying for everything that's like what I do and that's I take care of you and we were also in a very different financial place. He knew I was, I had like a, an average okay job, but he knew I didn't have, and he was in a different position. So in that way, you know, I think it can be, so it can, it can be very, it's hard to like put like a 
guideline on it. It's circumstantial. But at the same time, after our third date, he let me then, to, oh, I took him for ice cream to my favorite ice cream shop. And I said, I want to take you for ice cream because I also felt guilty. I felt like the amount of money this man had spent on me. And I, yes, I was like completely crushing on him, but I also was like, I want to do something. I don't want to just be taking, 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 because yeah. that's not who I am. Mm-hmm. I wasn't ready to invite him back to my house because I thought there are so many just different, you know, thoughts that go with that. So I was like, I would love to take you to my favorite ice cream store and my treat. And I was very specific. Like, I know it's not an expensive treat, but it's still my treat. This is my, you know, and I, and he was like, okay, but just this once, which made me love him more, but you know, but it was something like that. And then, and then what I started to do was then once I felt safe around him, I started having him to my house all the time. Like I would cook for him Mm -hmm. and it was something where like, I can go to a low cost, you know, um, grocer and buy something within my budget. You can make an amazing meal on very little. And that was what I did. I chose wine that was in my budget. And it was something that I think, even though it wasn't, I wasn't spending per se what I, you know, would have, if I was going out, he still saw the effort and how much I was putting into it. And like Mm -hmm. nowadays, I even think how how, I have a question for you all, because this is an interesting (laughs) topic. What do you think when, if you, if things are going really well, when do you think how many dates in would you say, okay, is the first okay time to have somebody back to your house? And, and, and second part to that question, not to reverse the roles here, but I am genuinely interested in this. What do you think, how do you say things like this is just dinner? If that's all you really want it to be, is there a nice way to say it? Mm, I don't think there is a right time. I, I think every couple is so different. Like, yeah. I don't think, I really firmly don't believe in like the three date rule or right. the five dates or like the, I mean, the first night, I think it all really just depends on the chemistry that you're having, what your expectations are and all of that. So yeah. I don't like these hard, fast rules. I think though, that being said, sex does bring other emotions into the equation. So I think right. you need to be aware of yourself, what you're looking for in this partner, like, and also right. sex can be so much better with someone that you have a deep connection with. So if that's what you're looking for, maybe it is good to hold out just so you can get a deeper connection. The etiquette here is interesting though, like what you just brought up of like, how do you say it? And I've also been in the situation where a guy has been really pushy and I haven't been into it. And that is also a tricky part too. I mean, I think personally, I mean, everyone should always respect everyone's boundaries and consent. So it's, I don't even know if it's an etiquette thing. It's more of just like, this is a must have. This is like, this is beyond etiquette. In terms of like what you can say, I think it's like, I had a really great time with you and I'm really enjoying getting to know you. Like, I want this to be special or whatever it may be, like give them encouragement, but be firm in the sense that like, this isn't happening. So, but you would say that you would say that upon inviting, like, that's what I'm saying is like, how oh, do you say, I, I just I want to have dinner with you? Mm. Oh, like, it's like, like you invited them to Yeah, because house. what if you're like, because what if you, you, what if you're a man and you want to invite someone over, maybe you can't afford to be taking this person out all the time. Mm-hmm. And so you say, I do want you to come over. I'm a really good cook, but like, you don't want her to think or him to think you're just inviting them over just to get them in bed. Okay. So like, what do you say? Like, what is the, like, you know, it's an interesting conversation to be like, I just like, I think, I feel like it kind of would be like just something like, you know, just dinner, no strings attached. I just want to invite you to a really nice dinner. I love cooking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then that's even, nice. Right. Yeah. I think like saying that, cause I do, I could see as a woman thinking that someone's being pushy if they're like, inviting sure. to their house, <laughs> sure you're good especially cook. after, I don't know. I'm still like, uh, I just feel like there are other alternatives and yeah. like the etiquette side here. Like, I think you could go to a park. I think you could do that picnic. Like if, even if you're a good cook and you love to yeah. cook, make some sandwiches and bring them to the picnic. Um, right. You could do a drink or a coffee that does not cost much. I think personally bringing someone to your home is when you guys have established that this is going to be something and you guys are both in the place. Like maybe you haven't had sex yet, but there's been a lot of physical contact. Like you've made out heavily. Things have been progressing. I think it's a little presumptuous to invite someone to the home, even if you caveat it. I don't know if I would fully believe it. Yeah. But that's just my opinion. You know, because there's always a hope that you do end up hooking up on both sides, right? Right. So I think it's always going to be on the table for any takers. But I do like it when the partner says something 
something along the lines of, I really want to cook for you. That is yeah. really sweet. I want to treat you to this recipe that I, I think I'm really good at making. So I, I personally think like the being really explicit about no expectations, no strings attached. I think that's optional. I don't, I think that's just, I don't know. I don't, I yeah. don't think the man needs to say that, but just give your intention outright, which is, I really want to treat you to some home cooking. I think right. you could say like, Hey, if you're not in the place yet to come to my house, I totally understand, but yeah. I really am excited about you and I want to cook for you. And I was thinking yeah, it'd be I a like fun that. date. So I it's like, like kind of giving someone an out, but also making it clear that like your intention is to provide for them in a way that might not be like a fancy dinner or something that's monetary that way. Right. And even like, if he's not even like for men, if men are like, oh, I'm not a good cook or something. I think there's so many options. Like, um, like with hello fresh, right. You go, mm -hmm. it's like you, the certain, like the service where you call and they send the meal, they send the wine, like everything mm -hmm. is there for you. Um, so eventually, especially now with COVID, right. Once people are able to, um, yeah. like New York in New York, at least as soon as things start opening again, when we right. start seeing each other one-to-one -one again. So you are going to be having more people at your house. Something that my boyfriend did in the beginning that I really appreciate now looking back on what he did was he asked me to come over. I mean, it was before we even had an official first date. He asked me to come over for dinner to his place, but he said, so I made reservations. I want our first date to be at this restaurant. It's next Wednesday. That's when I was able to get a reservation, but I still, I would love to see you before then. Would you want to come over? I'll t get like takeout. So then for me, it, it felt like there was going to be another date after me coming over. Did you guys have sex? We didn't. We didn't. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, I like that, that he was like showing it's not just going to be a one off and a one night thing. Like, that's not my intention here. Like, I want right. to take you somewhere nice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I like that move too. I remember I had a friend once that had a guy do that and she was very taken back by it because she was like, oh, I thought this was going somewhere. And now he says he wants to like, just come to me to just come to his house and be casual, whatever. And I think it yeah. like really did take that conversation of no, I actually just, I'm not like a guy that goes out a lot. And I like to be around like a girlfriend and like be hanging out and all that stuff. So I think there was some conversation right. that happened, but the initial first thought was this is like more of a casual thing. Well, then let's take the yeah. conversation there because the onus can't be all on the person who is being proactive and making that first move because the etiquette also comes from the receiver too. So if you're on the receiving end and you're not feeling it, what's proper etiquette of rejection? Yeah. Mm, I'm straightforward there. I'm super like, I will tell people, I think you should tell that person right away. I think if you're not feeling it or you're not comfortable with something, then, then it's okay to verbalize it. It's okay to be like, Oh, I, you know, I take things really slow. Mm, Could be yeah. the go-to saying like, Oh, you know, I, I, I'm just, I go extra slow. You know, this is just my thing. Like, Oh, that's good. I think the awkward part is when you make someone else feel awkward about something yes. they did. Yeah. So then take it back and put it on you. Like, I don't feel comfortable. Like it's, it's me. Like I don't, this is, I go slow. This is my thing. If someone leans in to kiss you, I cannot tell you the amount of kisses I had to dodge when I really <laughs> wish I could have just like going back and telling my younger self, I'd be like, just say, you know what? Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually going to hop in a cab or I don't need, you know, thank you so much for offering to walk me home, but I'm totally fine on my own. Thank you so much. Rather than just feeling mm. awkward saying, okay. And then you end up in the dark underneath your stoop, like in Manhattan. <laughs> and, then you get, and then you get a tongue on your cheek. It's just not nice. So like I, back then I would have been much more vocal. I love the thank you. Like that, mm. what you just said sounded so nice, even though you were super <laughs> nice. <laughs> Something Leave me alone. Get the fuck away from you. Yeah. Right. But you said it so etiquettely, right? <laughs> yeah, that is, that is proper etiquette. Yes. Cause you, you're right. It's, you still have to thank them for at least trying, right? It the takes, gesture. Yeah. yeah. It takes a lot of guts the to try. So yeah. And then you just state what you're uncomfortable with. What about after a first date and you're not feeling it <laughs> and no texts have been exchanged right after, do you tell that person right away that you're not feeling it or do you just wait for them to text you 
I would. Okay. So if that was the case, I, I would not reach out and be like, yes. sorry, I wasn't feeling it because then you also open up to that person and be like, yep, me too. And then you're like, oh, you weren't like, <laughs> you know, like sometimes things are better left unsaid. And, um, I think instead of being like, Hey, listen, and like starting an awkward conversation and yeah. ask that person, like why make it awkward rather than just saying instead, you know, just leave it. And only if that person reaches out to you, you'd be like, you are so interesting. I like, I loved hearing your stories about hiking up the volcano in Hawaii. I didn't feel more than a connection, mm. um, more than friends, but um, I love that. I love the giving them some positive that you yeah, did. Yeah. I call it a positive sandwich, positive, negative, positive. So you always start with something positive, <laughs> deliver the bad news and finish up with your it's something wonderful. You know what? That is my biggest pet peeve though in the world is when I get that text and I'm like, dude, I don't like you either. Like I don't need you to like <laughs> yeah. send me. Like I had this one guy that you ain't met him. There was like no connection at all. It was no. so clear. Oh totally gosh. hijacked an event I was going to. It's a long story. I won't go into that, but sent me an entire message, like this like paragraph of like this bad news he had a break and I'm like, dude, I, I don't even remember your name. Like, I'm sorry. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And people, people, I don't know why, like people just feel like they have to like end things or whatever, but if you weren't reaching out to him, he should have no. left it. Well, the way I feel, why I think it's bad etiquette is the way it comes off to me is that you're just trying to get the last word in. And it's like an ego thing. That's it's the way ego. I feel. It's all ego. That is a hundred percent ego. I what I broke things off with her. I didn't like right. that. Like they need to say that, and women right. too. Some women need to do that. Exactly. Um, but yeah, if you are on a date, if you went on a date, you don't feel anything, and that person doesn't reach out, you do not need to reach out to end things or say that you did not feel things. But also because it's hurtful. If, right. if mm-hmm. both the parties kind of just knew it and had the social intelligence to let it be, then it becomes hurtful. If then you say. Oh, and by the way, you know, thank you again for meeting up, but I just didn't feel it. It's like, I already it's just that. unnecessary. It's, it's unnecessary. totally unnecessary. I think though, ghosting, I mean, I, w- I would assume you would agree. Ghosting, I think you should always, if someone does reach out to you, I think what you said, that converse, the the sandwich, the positive sandwich, yeah. I think you <laughs> need to do that. Like, I think ghosting is just so like unacceptable at this point. Ghosting to me is, is just so unnecessary and one of the worst, it's just so unnecessary. Just be honest or just say you're, you're not into that person there. You know, like to me, there's, I actually have really interesting. Um, there was just a study that was done about the amount of people that have been ghosted. Mm. It's really good. So, okay. So here it is. I just brought it up on um, my phone. I can read it. So I'm, I work with Facebook on different like etiquette things. I'm like, um, um, like different, different, different questions that when the community asks, then I kind of chime in and give my two cents. So they did this survey and, um, 60% of Americans say they have read to see if someone has seen or read their message or seen their message. So when you think about that, think about how many people, so if I write a message to somebody I like, mm. then I will check 60% of people are checking to see if you didn't. Oh, like on Facebook Messenger? I'm like or Messenger. Like... If you send a message, if I send a message to you saying like, hey, how's it going? Would you want it? Like, do you want to go out? I'm checking. 60% of people are like checking. But then with the ghosting thing, it says more Americans have been ghosted by a friend versus someone they have dated. Interestingly, 54% of Americans say they've been ghosted by a friend. 46% say they've been ghosted by someone they were dating. Hmm. I think that's lo- probably bigger in bigger cities. I feel like yeah. the stats yeah. right here are a and lot some bigger. People, <laughs> some people may have been ghosted and had no idea that they were ghosted. That's true. Yeah. I think stats I've seen have been like 80%. Like it's like the majority by far. Yeah. But I think there's something about like if someone sends you a message and you're not interested, just don't check it and not respond. Right. Like that's, that to me bothers me. Even like that from a friend, if, if a friend, like, you know, in a text message, if, you know, especially if you're dating someone, you can see if someone's read your WhatsApps or you can see if somebody has read mm-hmm. your text messages, just respond and say, Hey, I'm, things are crazy right now. You know, like, I haven't forgotten about you or saw this, get back to you when oh I my God, or yes. something like, it's almost like it's, so it's like, I don't know what that's called. Cause that's not ghosting, but it's like, just, just communicate. Just tell me that you haven't, you know, dropped off face of the planet. When I see you, you've read my message. I think I that's think another that, one. 
that is huge. And I feel, I get it. Cause like, we feel like we need to respond immediately. Cause we're all, we all know everyone's like surgically attached to their phone, but yeah. sometimes like you do genuinely are busy with something else. I feel like I forget. actually like, yeah, it happens, but I feel like just that one message. And I've definitely said, I do this with my mom all the time. And I'm just like, <laughs> Hey, like I'm just like, really, I'm like in the middle of something, but let me call you later or let me call you tomorrow. So it's like, you're not ignoring them, but you're acknowledging. Yeah acknowledging that like you can't actually get to this at this exact moment. I do have a rule around that though. I feel like, because I really hate small talk over text. I think it goes nowhere. I, when I was online dating, so many of these messages just get into this texting black hole and I hated it. So my rule was I only respond to messages that end in a question, Mm. question mark. And because they're asking me a question. But if it's just something like super nice day out today. Or like, what about, hey, how are you? That bothers it, me it, too, it, though. No? It does bother <laughs> me, but at least I respond without a question. If they're right. like, uh, hey, right. how are you? I'll be like, I'm doing great, really busy today. But if, uh, if it's okay. just a message like, it's so beautiful out, I don't yeah. have the need to respond <laughs> yeah. to that. I mean, that's a statement. You're just putting it like a PR release out there. Like, it's a nice day. I agree, great. but then we've heard people getting offended by that, like <laughs> on our show and stuff. But I agree that I think if there's a way to write a rule, I think if someone asks you a question, you need to acknowledge it. And if they don't, then they should have been asking you a question if they wanted the conversation to start. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I like that. I agree. <laughs> no, that is a good one. What about topics that are that are taboo? Because you know, back in the day, it's like don't talk about your ex or yeah. sex or money yeah. or politics. I feel like anything goes these days. Are are there any off limit topics, etiquette wise? Um, I still think money is a weird one. Like even if that wasn't an old taboo topic, I still agree with it. Um, mm-hmm. for modern etiquette, I still don't think you know it's anyone's. It it just like. I feel like anything around, like, for instance, you're on a date and someone's like, wow, that's really expensive. That's even awkward (laughs) to me. Or because what if it's expensive to you, but not to me or vice versa, or even like pointing out somebody, wow, that is like, wow. Like just anything about money or asking how much something costs or, Mm. you know, I made this. Like I remember dating a man who on our second date, um, told me how much he, he was a trader and told me how much he had traded, um, wow. or how, like how much he pulled in the, the day before. Yeah. So he was taking me this to this place because he made this much. And I was like, Hey, that is so tacky. If yeah. you think that by saying that I'm a tra- more attracted to you, like, Hey, what is, what do you think I am? Um, and you know, I just don't like any kind of money talk. I think it's, it's, it's not nice. It makes people feel either insecure or it shows their insecurity by talking about money. Um, I don't like it. I think that's a key though. Cause I think like set, like talking about politics or religion or exes, even like relationship history, that's all stuff that could like help see if someone is a good partner for you. But I right. think just like throwing out like random things about money, like I mean, I guess you could art- cost. Oh, they think that's going to attract you, and even if it secretly does, even if that is impressive to you, certainly not what you want to put out there that you're dating someone because their financial, um, you know, what they can do financially for you. Because I don't like it. I don't. No. <laughs> I love how everything goes back to money. What do you think about someone who comments about the price of drinks at a bar? I've had someone I went on a date with who was like, oh my gosh, the prices of these drinks, it's through the roof, don't you think? Like, what do you think about, seems like a very innocent comment. Um, I, that would drive me up the wall. (laughs) <laughs> then that would drive me up the wall. I also think anything about money and dating kind of puts people together where they should be. Because if, if then, if I agree with you, if you are, say, say I'm out on a date with a man and he says, oh my gosh, these cocktails, that Manhattan, woo, price of Manhattan, sure. Wow. It's reflective. All right. Or whatever little comment like and I and I agree with him and I say oh my gosh this is insane like we should definitely go somewhere else and those two people are probably right for each other if I go Mm -hmm. out and he says this Manhattan is insane and I'm thinking I had four of those yesterday and this is cheap and that's probably not the right fit for those two people so it kind of like it kind of you know weeds weeds people out in terms of their you know because at the same time I think it's fair I have a lot of Mm -hmm. good friends in I think being in a city like Manhattan where the females are powerhouse yes they make more than five of my male friends combined these girls 
Um, and they say, they're always like, listen, it has nothing to do with this being a man woman thing. If this person can't hang with me and they, I need to buy their own flight to St. Bart or their flights, you know, like I want mm -hmm. them to be able to buy their own and I'm going to buy my own. And that's, you know, and, um, I understand and I agree with that too. So I feel like you have to find somebody that can play on your field. So if this is a compatibility thing, then why does, why is it like bad etiquette? Cause it still comes off weird. I think talking about money can make people feel uncomfortable. And that at the end of the day is what etiquette is in mm. place is in place for to make people feel comfortable etiquette. The true root of etiquette is to make people feel respected in, in that you're putting their feelings first. And by putting something out there that is either bragging because you have so much money or, or, you know, saying, Ooh, that's so expensive and making them feel awkward that maybe they were about to order that. And now they shouldn't. It's all about making mm. how you make other people feel and money often makes people feel uncomfortable. I think that is a great way to kind of kick off our takeaways and start to end this conversation. But I think for like my biggest takeaway is like that. It's like, think about this as a person. There's a human that you're on a date with and how would you want to feel respected and treated? Like I think of another example of just like kind of universal etiquette is like when someone just talks at you the whole time, like that doesn't make you feel good. It doesn't make you feel like someone wants to get to know you and to be with you. And that's what dating is all about. So I think the, like the rules of money or whatever it may be, it's like, it's not that there's hard, fast rules, but it's taking into account that there is a human there. You do not want to offend them. You want to make sure that you are kind of giving them the best experience that they can get because they are taking time out of their lives to meet yeah, you. I and agree. I think any like way that you can do that and maybe if you're unsure, you just need to have a conversation. Like there might be stuff that's just, like, there's just no hard, fast rules. There's some that I think we can all agree that are just like basic common sense and decency, but just don't be afraid to have it. And then think about too, from your perspective, like how would I want to be treated on this date if I was the other person and use that map to like outline your rules of etiquette. Yeah, I feel like my takeaway is very similar in that I feel like etiquette, the term, gets a bad rap. It's it, it feels like it's imposed rules. Yes. When it really should be a mindset and it's it really should be kind of like your set of values. That's what I think yes. etiquette is. So what do I value the most when it comes to treating other people and how I want to be treated? And I love what you said, Micah, is thinking of the other person first. So dating, and this is what we fall guilty of all the time in modern dating is it's all about me, 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 me. How does this person perceive me? When am I getting out of this date? What do they bring to the table for me? But if we switch it and say, what can I provide for this person? I'm with who is giving up their time to be with me, then I think the etiquette part just comes naturally. Again, mm -hmm. it's just not being an asshole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think I love that part that you just said about values because it kind of goes back to the yeah. money one because I still think this is a tricky one. And I think that we've gotten some definitely good tips on this. You know, like it's just so subjective based on your own mm -hmm. values, but maybe you are the type of guy or girl that really does believe in equality. Like that should be the partner you're finding. Like, because if that is such a core belief of yours and you really truly right. feel like you should be splitting everything down the middle or alternating who does what like maybe that is the partner you seek and you're not looking for that person that wants to be paid for on the first date mm -hmm. right that's bubble tea man he was looking for that equal partner and that yeah yep yep Micah, any closing remarks or anything that you just want to kind of leave for our listeners? Um, I think just if it doesn't feel right, don't do it. You know, if it doesn't mm -hmm. sound right, don't say it. Um, and just to remember that you never want to hurt someone because some of my most horrific dating, like, adventures that I can remember in stories, it was because I felt hurt. And like, even though I'm, that's long, that was a long time ago, I still remember it so that, you know, you can still, um, you can really affect somebody. So just to be gentle and be kind to people and, and hope that they can do the same for you. 
I love that because I do agree with you that like it stays with us. And I think like even if you're one tiny experience for someone, if 20 people did that to them or even five did it to them, it's going to really impact their psyche when it comes to dating. Mm -hmm. And I loved what you said earlier. Like you gave so many good verbatim words that people could use of how you can say no and let someone down, but do it in like a nice, respectful way. So I think a good rule of thumb too is if you ran into this person on the street, would they be like oh that fucky asshole or would they be like okay I'm cool seeing you like I think especially Mm -hmm. when you're in smaller cities like even San Francisco like we run into people all the time and thinking about that when you're leaving like lasting impressions on people I mean there should be a side that you're doing it for them but also just the fact that like this is a small city things get around and you want to also preserve your own reputation at the same time too it's true it's like be nice and be respectful that's it. Simple. Wouldn't simple, that be just simple? Simple gets so on, hard people. for people. <laughs> <laughs> you forget yeah. it sometimes. Micah, if people want to reach you, what's the best way for them to find you? Oh, I am so easy to reach. Um, I am on Instagram, just at my name is M-Y-K-A-M-E-I-E-R at Micah Meyer. Um, I just launched a YouTube channel, so I give lots of fun Ooh free lessons. And I have a dating one coming up actually. Um, and yeah. And then I have my two books now, business etiquette made easy and modern etiquette made easy. So I'm here and thank you so much for having me. You two are brilliant. It's so awesome. needed. It's this podcast is so needed. Thank you. Aww. And we'll link that all in the show notes too. So people can easily find them. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Micah. We'll end this conversation. Stay, Stay dateable. dateable. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag Stay Dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable.